Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good tomorrow, wherever you are in the world listening to us. As you know, I'm Fred Plotkin, host of Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, in which I invite people, mostly musicians, who inspire me to come on and talk about what inspires them in this time when more than ever we need inspiration. And I'm thrilled to have the, I'm going to call you a singer rather than a soprano, a mezzo-soprano. I'm not going to ascribe a voice category to you. The singer, Rosalind Plowright, who joins us from Salisbury in the UK. Welcome, Rosalind. Hello. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to dive right in first by mentioning that um, the music suggestions on Adagio that you provided as inspiration can be found attached to this page. And then when this becomes a YouTube video, you'll find it there. But they include the Bach Concerto for two violins, Arcangelo Corelli's Concerto Grosso in, I'm not reading my writing, looks like D minor, maybe G minor or C minor. In other words, known as the Christmas Concerto. Maria Callas singing Bellini's Adon Crede Mirarti from La Sonambula, Tchaikovsky's Serenade for Strings, um, Elgar's Enigma Variations, but specifically number nine, the Nimrod, and Purcell's Dido and Aeneas When I Am Laid in Earth, sung by Janet Baker. Plus, had you not added them, I would have two <laughs> selections of you singing Verdi from La Forza del Destino and Il Trovatore. That's right. What, what inspires you? How did these make the list and what qualifies as inspiration? Well, I loved the violin before I became a singer. I, I started to play the violin when I was eight. And um, I, I only played it for 10 years because when I started to study music seriously, I had to give it up. Um, it, it sort of clashed with my vocal projection in a way, because when I first started uh, singing, I used my, my chin used to go, this, my head used to lean to the left, <laughs> like I was clasping the violin. But I, I, loved, I loved the violin so much. And um, the, the, the Bart double was something that I was given when I, when I was about um, 14. And, it, you know, I, I practiced it for years, to be honest. It's not, it wasn't um, uh, sort of one of those things I just could play. <laughs> uh, I had to practice very hard as a violinist. And, um, and I used to practice it in the lunch hour at school. And um, just so that I didn't have to uh, go out and be in the cold. They would keep us in a nice warm classroom. And I was with the, the other girl who played the second violin. And it, it, and then eventually we ended up playing it with the school orchestra, <laughs> yeah. which was um, interesting. But, uh, and, and I had the great pleasure once at some um, award ceremony to actually sit next to Yehudi Menuhin. Huh? And when I told him this story, you know, he, he, his eyes lit up. But, um, you know, an, an instrument like that, you, you have to keep going with it. And I put it down when I was 18 years old, but, but I love listening to that particular Bach double violin concerto. Also, often, yes. Often when I teach music to people who are not in the field and I try to give them cognates to think about, Sometimes I use visual arts to understand music or emotion, but a lot of times I use musical instruments to relate to the voice. And I'm hardly the first to use the violin for the soprano voice, the viola for the mezzo soprano and so forth. Um, did you feel a connection in playing the violin to your voice? And did you see it as an extension of the voice or was it something that had to be put aside so you can fully activate your own voice. It, yeah, the, the, the latter. I, I did have to um, put it aside because I, uh, you know, after I've been, when I got to know about the world of opera, 
um, at, at, actually at the tender age of 13, um, I began to probably not practice as much as I should have done on the violin and, and the, the singing just started to take over. And um, so I was very much, yeah, I know there have been singers in the past that have, have, have sort of played the violin and it, it does seem that way that it was a natural progression towards the soprano voice. But in my case, it was just the passion for singing and, and the voice, the voice, the voice of Maria Callas actually, um, <laughs> that inspired me to pursue that, you know, my, my operatic voice, um, which I actually discovered, as I say, at about the age of 13 or 14. And, um, I was going to ask you now about Collis. Uh, as you know, I'm sitting here in Manhattan, and she was born not too far from where I'm seated. People forget that she was a New Yorker, and I recognize that, and we New Yorkers do, because she had that personality, like it or not. Mm. But um, she was a person of the world. Just briefly on her, she was born in 1923, December 2nd, if I recall, and lived here for 13 years, went to school here, learned English as her first language, spoke Greek, uh, had a rough home life, and her parents parted and her mother made what I didn't think was a good decision in 1936 to move with her daughters to Greece. And um, then World War II broke out and Collis was caught in the middle of that. She studied with a singer named Elvira Hidalgo, who was a great mm -hmm. teacher, and recognized and developed Collis's gifts. And people who want to can go to YouTube and find interviews with Elvira Hidalgo talking about the process of teaching Maria Collis. Mm -hmm. uh, she made her debut in Athens and then in the late 40s sang in Mexico City, Aida with the famous interpolated E flat. Uh, okay. She was brought to Verona in the late 1940s. She sang at La Scala. She married well from a professional, if not personal, point of view. Mm -hmm. And then in the early 1950s, a golden era at La Scala, when you had directors such as Lucchino Visconti and the very mm -hmm. young Franco Severelli assisting Visconti and then working on his own, she developed with them the theatrical side, in addition to having maestros such as Vittorio Gui, uh, Tullio Serafin and others. And that was part of the formation of the person she was. And I wanna get very specifically to a question about La Sonambula since that's what you selected. Um, Callas famously said in an interview that her focus on every role, but in this case, the orfanella, the peasant girl, the orphan Amina, was truth. And she saw this orphan girl as being poor and not dressed well and, and meaning well, but not having the proper gesture and manners that one would want. And Visconti insisted on putting her in diamonds and looking very glamorous. And they had a big fight over this. And Collis objected saying, this is not what Amina wants and this is not what Amina is. And Visconti said, no, but the La Scala public wants Maria Callas and Amina to be dressed in jewels and diamonds. And she did, hence all the photos of her that way. Um, you're a wonderful... <laughs> I I'm, never knew I'm, that, actually. I, I'm going to bear... That. I'm going to give you the compliment because I know it to be true. In addition to being a great singer, you are a wonderful actress. And I'm wondering how you draw from other artists, how you drew from within yourself to form the total portrayals that you do, which are not just musical, of course, but are dramatic in terms of acting, but also in terms of vocal acting. How do I draw from other singers? How do you create your characters? How do I create my characters? Right, well, it's, it's a sort of, for me, it's a very, natural process and I, I, um, it, it's in the music, you know, I always find that the music is very um, inspirational with finding the drama, you know, but it, I think for me, um, 
I always have to, you know, it's the director. I, I am so good. I'm not one of these singers that, I mean, I say good, I'm a good girl. I do what I'm told. <laughs> and if the director um, asks me to do whatever he asks me to do, I sort of do it. You know, for instance, years and years ago, I actually sang Aida in a crazy production in Frankfurt in the early eighties. Um, and um, they, the, it was a, a director called Hans Neuenfels. Um, and it was so scandalous and controversial, this, this particular production, um, it was sold out. Uh, you know, it ran for about on and off, they kept bringing it back. And, um, but he, I mean, you know, for, for the most beautiful sublime line that Aida has to sing in the Nile aria, he had me lying on the floor with my head under a chair. Um, you know, oh no, sorry, that not that. Uh, that was another another bit. But it, it you know, I I just <laughs> you might think, oh, what's that got to do with it? But it, the the drama. Um, I always found whatever they gave me to do, I could you know bring some of my own instinct into it as well. And and I've. Um, I've watched great actors um, and I, I love watching great actors that, that sing opera as well. Um, and I, I think when I, it, I don't, I just go to the rehearsals with an open mind and, and have it fed to me. And throughout the rehearsal process, I become that character, hopefully. Um, I remember when I did Elizabeth the um, First with John Copley mm -hmm. in Maria Stuarda way back, and uh, <laughs> he said, "So what do you know about Elizabeth? You know, and well, I, mean, I, I know all about her historically." And um, uh, he he was very funny. He was um, said, "Well, let one queen show another." <laughs> so um <laughs> you know him as Uncle John. Yeah, in, that was in John. the upper that was world, everyone John. knows him as Uncle John. <laughs> yeah, and um uh, you know, so so I've, I and then there was Jonathan Miller, who was uh, um for me well, before I was even allowed to uh sing a note of Desdemona, he had the whole cast there. And he showed us uh, uh, the play, the whole play of of uh, Othello. And um, he just produced it for the BBC. Um, and, you know, again, it was just that inspiration from watching these um, wonderful Shakespearean actors. And, but I, I always found something from that and something from me, you know. I think it's something that you, you have inside you, you know, and um, it's, I don't think it's something you can always teach that well. You can be guided, but it's something that has to come from so deep within. So um, there is yeah. the question I've been most eager to ask you, and I've only asked one other British artist this, namely Thomas Allen, a number of years ago in Verbier. I was teaching master classes, and so was he, and I had a chance to sit down with him in, in a public conversation, and with him it regarded Mozart, but with you it's going to regard whomever you want. Um, I, as a New Yorker, but someone who has visited the UK and lived and worked in the UK a lot since I'm the age of 17, in addition to living and working in Italy, have always been astonished and delighted by the British theatrical tradition, namely spoken theater, Broadway, the West End, mm -hmm. Shakespeare, whatever the British undertake. I won't say it's perfect, but it's always at a very high level, whether it's comedy, tragedy, everything. And I've been very aware that there are magnificent British actors and actresses, stage directors, playwrights, and so on. It's in your country's DNA, the theater. And that said, I ask myself, how do British opera singers who grow up exposed to that theatrical tradition feel different or how do they bring in their Britishness in that sense to their theatricality in opera? Because it's frankly, you, you all come from a tradition that's kind of wonderful that not every other country has in the same way. Russia has it a bit 
Italy yeah. has it a bit, but no, no one has it like Great Britain. No. Did growing up British and being having theater in your blood and your education and your language inform what you do as an opera singer? Um, well, you know, I, be, I became an opera singer very, um, well, the, the passion for opera was there at 18. So I, I couldn't afford to go to the, the theater and, and living where I did in those days, it was a long time ago. Um, there weren't always that many opportunities but once I was able to go to the theater, um, it was my passion. I mean, uh, every, every twice a year, we, we go up to Stratford-on-Avon, Stratford-up-on-Avon, and uh, see as m much Shakespeare as we can. And um, I, I love the freedom of, of the way these, these, um, these particular Shakespearean actors act, you know, they, they it's a, it's a fearlessness, um, you know, once they manage to deliver <laughs> the, the Shakespeare dialogue, which is not easy. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think I, I've lost, you know, Fred, I'm sorry. I, I, what was the exact question? How being British and growing up in a nation where spoken theater whether you see it on television, whether you heard it on BBC radio, I know that I heard plays and not just by Shakespeare, but Ibsen yeah. and Chekhov on BBC radio living in New York. And then when I lived in London, hearing it there on yeah. the radio. So I, I sort of was on the right track then. Um, yes. Well, absolutely. absolutely. You know, it is, uh, uh, the, the London is, uh, is sort of, you might call it the theater capital of the world. And and once and when I eventually came to London as as a young student in well I was um, probably twenty one actually to to go to the London the then London Opera Centre that's when it all opened up for me and I was able to get as much theatre as as I possibly could in those days there were always free tickets available for something or other, Ma mainly the dress rehearsals of Covent Garden, um, which of course is opera, it's not theater, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, no, there were, um, well, when we were studying, I studied actually in Manchester at the Royal Manchester College of Music. Mm -hmm. It's now the Royal Northern College of Music. Yes. But we, we did a lot of drama. We did a lot of, um, of, of straight drama, you know, a lot of plays. Um, which I loved. <laughs> still, I still do, really. I mean, um, but, you know, a lot of uh, the acting profession and, and wanting to go on the stage to act in theatre or film, whatever. I mean, my goodness, it's, it's so competitive, isn't it? It's, yeah. And I, I when once my voice took over, um, for me, it was it was a way of getting on the stage and being able to perform. But, um, you know, to begin with, the roles that I, I sang were, were, didn't sort of give me that many opportunities, you know, they were yeah. part um, and bar. <laughs> the one quibble I have with certain British stage directors, I'm not talking about actors or singers here, is some of them are brilliant. Some of the mm -hmm. ones I've worked with who come from spoken theater and go into opera often do not speak the language of the opera and often do not read music and therefore rely on the libretto and perhaps go to the source material so that if you're doing Verdi's version of Macbeth, we would say the Scottish play, but Verdi's Macbetto, um, mm -hmm. I know I've worked with British stage directors who have read the libretto, which is a very good one actually, but then went back to the Shakespeare original and perhaps added a dash of Scotland into it, but don't use the music. You said to me a few minutes ago that you find a lot of your suggestions and ideas for acting and singing, or especially acting, in the music. And that's what I find lacking in stage directors everywhere, but opera stage directors. But frankly, especially in Britain, I think because it's such a text and language driven country, 
from its theatrical point of view. Mm -hmm. Have you, you don't have to name names, but have you experienced that in terms of a lack of knowledge theatrically on certain people who undertake opera? Um, I have once or twice, but generally, um, no, they are very up to date with the music. Um, but it is very frustrating when you are a singer and, and the director will ask you to do something that goes against the music. <laughs> um, um, and, um, but that I have not actually, um, in England anyway, in Germany, yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> but in, in um, you know, in, in at home, I, I, I'm racking my brains now, but there, there was a, a couple of occasions when I remember a, a theater actor came, uh, came in and um, quite clearly, you know, didn't really know the music very well or, no. or want to, you know, he just had this vision for the entire piece. But um, generally, I think nowadays it's, it's um, they, most of them, they, they do know their stuff. I mean, gosh, mm -hmm. they, they are, they're very, they can be quite intimidating as well because of their knowledge, you know, they speak several languages and- Oh, good. They, no, I mean, it's uh, from my from my own experience anyway. I've um, been lucky. Let me tell you. A well, couple I, I know. I, I say that there is one exception actually, and I, it's just I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I I years ago I work I sang the role of Madame Butterfly, which is quite hard to believe in a way because of my great height and among other things, you know I. I sang it in Houston, and the director was Ken Russell. Oh, yes. Uh, who everybody knows from his very, um, well, his films, you know. Um, uh, what was it? The Devils of Ludan. What yes. Else? You know, I mean, he Tommy. Was, oh, sorry? Tommy. Tommy, the music yeah. lovers about Tchaikovsky and one about Liszt and uh, maybe one about Mahler. That's right. I forget. No, yeah. he... Yeah, he, he was certainly um, loved his music, you know, there's no doubt about it. But, but some of his ideas were, were um, you could say, you could say they were genius, but to many they would have been outrageous, you know. Um, his Mephistopheles that he did, did you ever hear about that in Genoa? No. no. Um, and then, in fact, I think Puccini's daughter um, Simonetta. had him fired from. Yeah. I know I don't know where he was he was doing La Boheme somewhere and uh, then he was banned from Italy and um, and you know but in a way when I did this Madam Butterfly I thought well I'm so unconventional uh, he wanted a butterfly that looked the completely wrong and he certainly got it with me <laughs> well you know there was a Japanese opera singer she's no longer with us named Yoko Watanabe yeah, no, I remember her. And she was quite tall as well. Ah, oh, but she was Japanese, you know. She was amazing. <laughs> I, I remember her. Yeah. I, I saw her perform it in Frankfurt. And I, yeah. she, I didn't know that she was no longer with us. Yeah, quite a few years now. Beautiful. Um, mm. Was the Ken Russell production of Madame Butterfly, I wonder if it's the same one that I saw at the Spoleto Festival, which had a lot of Sony television monitors yeah. everywhere and it looked like Japan, the Ginza 1960s. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's how it ends. It, it ends yeah. with Nagasaki, um, you know, the explosion. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> neo -lighting, yeah, the audience, the, the lighting in, you know, was, was completely blinding for the audience. Um, it was, yeah, it was quite dramatic. Yeah. But in Houston in those days, they, they were quite appalled by it all. Um. <laughs> I should say though about the Houston Grand Opera for people who don't know, we think of it as being Texas, whatever associations go with that. It has long been one of the most forward thinking, progressive, adventurous companies in the world, commissioning right. more new opera than any American opera company. So it's quite a place actually. And well, I that, yeah, I'm sure, you know, this is what, 35 years ago? Yeah. So um, yeah. a lot can happen in 35 years. 
Um, I wanted to ask you also about the fact that in opera, we have a term which sounds rude to outsiders, but I'll pronounce it correctly, Fach, F-A-C-H. Yeah. And Fach is a German word, of course. And what that applies, and it's a loaded term in my view, is the group of roles that a singer is by her talents, gifts, temperament, voice, predisposed to or best suited for. Hmm. And there are certain types such as a Brunhilde kind of dramatic soprano or hmm. a lyric tenor, things like that. We know what we mean about those roles. Yeah. But then there are other singers who do not neatly fit in a Fach, nor do we want them to. Uh, <laughs> Callas, Montserrat Caballé, Jesse mm -hmm. Norman, you, mm -hmm. to name a few. Um, I'm not saying, Jesse always said, uh, pigeonholes are for pigeons. And, <laughs> <laughs> and there's just no reason to have to feel confined. So I'm not in any way saying that you should, but you have covered in your career an unusually large range of roles in terms of language, temperament, uh, where the music sits in the voice, as your voices evolve through the years. Would you, for listeners who don't really understand Fach and, and how a singer's career progressive progresses, if it's like yours, where you began in terms of roles and where you went to, where you are now? Well, um... For me, though, I just wanted to be, regardless of what I could or couldn't do, my, I, I just wanted to be a, a soprano. I want an, a, a, more of a spinto soprano. Um, and so when- you know, I, I'll just define spinto comes from the Italian spingere to push, but push does not imply something forced. It just means it has a little more oomph. Hmm. So, so when, when I was studying, um, I didn't, you know, I, when I began, I, we didn't know these things. We, well, we hadn't, you know, I, I just knew the repertory I wanted to sing was, was higher rather than lower, um, which, was, which was strange because I, you know, I, I, um, I was quite, underdeveloped in those days and I my, in fact my voice was in three bits it had a you know the chest voice the middle and then it, and it had the top and it, it could have gone anywhere really I think but I I worked getting getting it right at the top um, and when I left music college I auditioned to go to the this place, um, well, it was for young artists. Now they have young artist programs. We didn't have that. We had, um, well, we had in those days the, the London Opera Center. And, and that's, they said, well, you know, we, we can't, we, we're not, we're going to make you sing the mezzo roles. And I was, I was very upset about it because of the, uh, the color of my voice, I guess. Um, but at the same time, I was still always working at, at um, becoming a soprano, which, which in fact I was at that time. So saying, the roles I did then were, were, were um, the you know the, all the old ladies' roles, which is what I'm doing now actually. So it's got I've gone full circle. So I started off uh, when I left the opera center. Um, my voice had you know, really begun to develop in the right direction. And I was given soprano roles like La Contessa, more lyrical in a way, um, the Countess in, in, uh, in Figaro, Donna Elvira, um, and um, Fior di Ligi. Uh, in fact, I think Mozart's wonderful for young singers. But then when my, when my career, I still knew that I wanted to be this other type of soprano, you know, having listened to Callas singing Tosca and, and, and all the wonderful roles that, um, you know, back then I, my, my mother bought me a long playing record of Maria Callas and, uh, and I was, um, you know, um, very 
inspired by all that repertory. And that's what I wanted to do, you know, it was which ridiculous in a way because I wasn't ready to do it, but I nevertheless kept going. And um, I worked through, um, through this period and, and came out as a, a spinto, uh, as a, the, the roles that I'm sort of better known for in a way. And um, of course, over the years, as uh, after having my children, you know, voices do change. And so it, it, I went back, I went back to being a mezzo again, uh, not, not out of choice, I didn't want to, but somebody suggested that I sing Amneris. Um, and, and that's how it all began 21 years ago with my mezzo career. And, and now, uh, at, this, at this stage now, I'm, I'm, I'm back with the old ladies, the character roles. So I've, I've sort of gone full circle with my voice. It, it, I, I, you know, so what was I, you know, I was a, um, what am I? <laughs> You're a singer. A singer that loves yeah. to act. Um, yeah. And it's very important to me that the problems I used to have as uh, singing some of the early Verdi roles, that the characters didn't have enough um, for me to get hold of, you know? It was really, you know, Leonore in, in, in Trovatore, it's all about the singing. Yeah. Uh, as most of those, um, you know, the later Verdi is more, more, more on offer with, with the drama. Um, people are thinking, my God, what are you saying? But you know, apart from Lady Macbeth and the Bucco and the Wicked Ladies, mm -hmm. some of that early Verdi stuff, it, you know, it, it really is, you know, stand and deliver. And that um, frustrated me, yeah. It was Einstein who said that the secret to happiness is to be able to enjoy every phase of life. And I, I agree with him that there are things that we put aside because nature tells us to, because we've moved to other things. And I find it concerning when people either feel they have to relive their youth, they have to do what they've always done because this is what I've always done. Um, mm -hmm. One of the inspiring things I find in your work and career is the way you have moved forward. And you've built on what you've learned in terms of your artistry, but you've taken it in different directions. But before I forget, we we're talking about Verdi. Did you ever do any of the women in Falstaff? No, I didn't, no. I, at this point, would love to see you in whichever role you want in that opera. Uh, I, I think exactly. you would, I think I'm sending the word out to my producer friends. Which one <laughs> would you like? Would you like quickly at this point? Oh, no, I, I, it would have to be quickly. I, I mean, I, there's no way I could do Alice, no. I know. No. I would love to have seen you as Alice at a certain point. Now, yeah, that would um, be great. Hmm. We, I first came into contact with your singing through your Verdi. And I heard you in both Leonora's and have the recordings and so on. And, and you included them on your list. But as I said, I would have had you not done that. Um, and you sang with Jose Carreras and, and Placido Domingo, and these are really classic recordings. Mm -hmm. Giuseppe Sinopoli conducted, Carlo Maria Giulini conducted. Um, I worked with Sinopoli a little bit when he came to the Met to do Tosca when the Zeffirelli production was due in 1985. That's where we had contact. Uh, I had worked with Zeffirelli in the past and remained friends and collaborators with Zeffirelli. So it was through him that I met Sinopoli. Sinopoli from Venice studied psychology, philosophy. He looked more like a Central European denizen of a smoky cafe than mm -hmm. an Italian conductor. Giulini was Italianissimo. He was very elegant. He was from Southern Italy, from Puglia. Uh, one of my very favorite musicians of all was Carlo Maria Giulini. Would you talk about these two conductors and your work with them? I will certainly um, talk, yes. I mean, uh, well, the first was Giulini and um, I, was, I was put in front of Giulini several times, actually. I mean, this uh, Leonora Trovatore was not handed to me on a plate by any means. I was, heard by 
a um, couple of people from Deutsche Grammophon in a concert I did in London and um, uh, and they they obviously thought that I would I could audition because they knew they were they were about to start they were looking for Leonora in in a new a new recording by Giulini and that was what in in 1982 mm -hmm. and um, I I was eventually I, I auditioned for him, but I wasn't actually allowed to audition for him until I'd worked with um, his right arm man called Roberto Benaglio. I don't know if you've come across that name. He was the chorus master at La Scala. Mm -hmm. And um, he was uh, very strict with me, he, he, you know, and uh, eventually he, he, he told them, yeah, she's ready. She can sing for the great maestro. Now, I was absolutely terrified because when I was a, a, a student in back in those days you'd go into record shops you know, record long playing records no DVD CDs and um, there were these magnificent posters of Giulini standing there looking like a male model just looking utterly divine just like God you know yeah. and for me to suddenly stand in front of him having to sort of perform this music I mean I I was it was all it was I I sort of seized up and um, there were a lot of people in the room there was Deutsche, it was a room at one of the big rooms at Covent Garden chorus room I think and um, I, I just I, I was almost choking with fear <laughs> and I was in perfectly good voice but I, I just something was stopping me and um, my agent who is now my husband <laughs> actually went up and whispered in Giulini's ear. He said, Maestro, it might be a bit better if, if you um, send some of these people out, if you just work with her yourself, you know, she will relax because he, he couldn't understand, you know. And sure enough, they all left the room with the exception of Giulini and Benaglio. And he began to work on the act for Aria with me. And I just relaxed and, I, and it was just one of those divine moments when this great maestro who I you know like my hero was suddenly um, giving me this amazing advice information and, and I, I was able to do it <laughs> and I, I relaxed and um, the next day I was told that I had the role of, of Leonora in Wonderful. this poetry gramophone. I met him in 1980 I met him actually in 79 in Italy, but we re-met and I was invited to collaborate with him in 1982. Los Angeles being a wonderful city in the United States, but it didn't have much of an opera tradition for all kinds of reasons. San Francisco, great historic con company. San Diego had a long tradition. LA was famous for its Philharmonic, which is a magnificent group. Mm, and yeah. um, Giulini was the conductor of the LA Philharmonic, yeah. mm -hmm. and he desperately wanted LA to have an opera tradition, which eventually came a couple of years later when a co-national of yours, Peter Hemmings, was invited to LA to found the LA Opera with mm -hmm. Placido Domingo, and I worked there mm -hmm. for a period. But the seed of that was 1982, when the LA Philharmonic did an absolutely wonderful Falstaff starring Renato Bruzon. And it was such I remember a, that, yeah. Yeah. It was such mm -hmm. a huge sensation that mm -hmm. people in LA rose up and said, we have to have opera in Los Angeles. So with the advent of the Olympics in 1984, the LA opera in effect was born presenting Turandot with Placido Domingo and Gwyneth Jones. Mm -hmm. And that put opera on the map in LA, but it really was because of the Giulini Falstaff. One more thing about Giulini. Um, he too was, did not have a fach, so to speak. A lot of times we expect Italian conductors to only do Italian works. I defy anyone to show me a better performance of the Brahms, the four Brahms symphonies than mm -hmm. Giulini. And I invite listeners to go hear those because they too are very inspiring. Oh, um, now, let's talk a little about St. Petersburg in the sense that uh, you sang La Forza del Destino uh, with Carreras and Bruzon and Sinopoli on recording. And mm -hmm. Verdi wrote that for 
St. Petersburg for the opera company there. And he revised it somewhat. It, it appeared then in Milano. And the role of Leonora in Forza was sung by Teresa Stoltz. And Teresa Stoltz is a very important figure in that, yes, Verdi was married to Giuseppina Straponi, who sang in Nabucco with, for him in 1842. And then she retired to become Mrs. Verdi eventually. But one of the next inspirations musically was Teresa Stoltz. It's rumored they had an affair. I don't think so. I don't care, frankly. But uh, it was Stoltz who sang the Leonora in Milan uh, when in 1869. It was Stoltz who was the first Aida in Milan. It was Stoltz who, after the death of Straponi, looked after Verdi. And he died January 27th of 1901, having built the home for retired musicians. It still exists in Milan now with the royalties from... Uh, all of his operas saved Trovatore, Rigoletto, and Traviata. All, royalty for all the others went to that. And Stoltz was the one who opened the home on October 10th, Verdi's birthday in 1902. And she died very soon thereafter. So uh, Verdi was deeply inspired in creating and refashioning the Leonora that you sang, specifically to the talents of Teresa Stoltz, who was Czech, by the way. And that's a different kind of Leonora than the Trovatore. Uh, she is a hermit, as we come to discover. Um, the force of destiny, which I reinterpret as meaning bad luck, um, <laughs> is, is something we all face, but she does in the extreme, and she does it by withdrawing. And I thought of this Leonora recently because Many of us, like it or not, in this period of the pandemic have become hermits or have readapted our lives. So when she exits the cave to sing or the, wherever she's been, pace, pace, mio Dio, God, give me peace, give me peace. Um, <laughs> I, I re-listened to you doing that yesterday in preparation for our conversation. I wept because it was just so about the moment. And that to me is what a great artist such as Verdi and a great artist such as you can capture in a work from the past. And it's about right now. Um, are you aware when you sing certain roles that suddenly they achieve a kind of human residence that we don't necessarily anticipate? I, I did with, with that sort of music, yes, that, um, absolutely. N nowadays, um, the repertory is slightly different, so I, I don't get quite that uh, buzz, buzz for want of a better word, but, you know, certainly performing those amazing, that amazing Verdi music, I mean, um, it, you... you it, it, it does, and if you're in good voice and you're on top of it, you know, with all the technical challenges, and to be honest, the, the, the Leonora, the Forza, is uh, not quite as technically challenging as the, uh, the, the Il Trovatore okay. Leonora. Um, uh, and so the more relaxed one can be about the voice, um, then something else does take over. And... Mm. Um, with with uh, this amazing uh, the, the the text and 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 those wonderful melodies that Verdi wrote. I mean, what more can you say? I, as I say, the drama is through the music. Mm -hmm. But certainly, I mean, if I were to sing Leonora in Forza now, I don't, I don't think I'm <laughs> the idea of a blubbering wreck at the end. But um, but back, yeah, no, it it was um, it was wonderful doing it with, with Sinopoli and Carreras. Um, I, I, I really had a great, um, great time doing that piece. I remember it so well. And, and, and Sinopoli, you know, Sinopoli was, was so different for an Italian, you know, he was, he was very, what can I say, mathematical. <laughs> he was yeah. very organized with his music. He was, I mean, Giulini was like God and it was from the heart and, and, and it, it Sinopoli was a bit more 
you know, low key about it with, with yeah. his actual heart, but very, um, very uh, suddenly he would get very excited and, um, and, and, and things would happen. But, but two very different conductors, very. both being Italian, you know. Um, I well, was, in fact, I, one issue I always take with so many people, in fact, most people, is their willingness or their desire to generalize about countries, peoples, traditions, religions, races, and so on. I'm going to get back to that in a moment about England. But um, I first wanted to talk to you about the fact that a couple of days ago, I watched a stream from Holland Park Opera of... Um, Un Balo en Mascara, The Masked Ball, which was a very fine production. I really did enjoy it a lot. And you played <laughs> Madame Arvidsson, who is known in some versions of the opera as Ulrika. In mm -hmm. other words, a woman, a, a CRS, a woman who sees a lot more and sometimes she doesn't like what she sees. <laughs> you call her a fortune teller, but I don't, I don't view that quite the same way. No, no, very, very different. Would you talk about that particular production and direction? Because it was modernized, but it was not modern. And mm. I felt that just about every artistic decision that could be made was made correctly. But start by talking about the fascinator, the hairpiece, that, the, the hat <laughs> that you wore, which was a yeah. metaphor throughout the opera. Even after your character leaves, we see her in drawings with the That's fascinator. Right, yeah. Hmm. Well, th this this was um, again the designer and the director. You know, they're both Greek. They were both Greek. A wonderful um, young director, Rojula Gaetano. She's hmm. um, very talented, very talented, and we're we're actually very good friends. And we are at the moment creating something else, which I won't talk about. But. Um, a, a, a virtual performance, you might say. Um, she, I've done, I've, I've done the, a few pieces with her, and um, so she knows me, and she knew, you know, when I, uh, Ulrika is, is um, when you, Ulrika, you always imagine the cauldron, you know, and the gypsy and the, the fortune teller, and I just didn't see myself like that at all. Um, and so when they came up with this design, for me, I was delighted, you know, I thought, gosh, that's so, just so right for me. And again, if you, if you feel you fit the part, <laughs> it really helps all around with, with everything, with the music and, and the drama. But um, she, she, she's, she's very, very talented. And, and the, the actual headdress, well, you know, this was what was supposed to create my, me looking into the future my prophecies, but, um, um, you know, full of original ideas, you know, the fact that she was very surprised when one of her prophecies came true, you know, I mean, actually, that you didn't, you didn't actually see that. But um, I love this, this, um, the way that she had me play her, in a way, you know, it was, it was right for me, uh, and my physicality. Um, so, and the whole, the whole production could have been a premonition for coronavirus, actually. With the, You're right. Um, You're the, right. The, the mask that she puts on in Act 2. I mean, I thought, gosh, that's sort of hitting the nail on the head at the moment. But, um, of course, none of us, this was a year ago, so um, none of us knew what was coming. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, again, as I say, I'm an open book. And, and I, I'm led by the director mm -hmm. and thrilled. I mean, if there was something really awful I was asked to do, I might, nowadays, I might put up a bit of a fight. Mm -hmm. But generally, I'm just very keen to sort of do the drama, sure. whatever, it, whatever it takes. <laughs> um, I don't know if you know this about me, but in addition to my working in opera, I write what the British call cookery books. I'm a food historian and I've lectured a lot at Oxford and I'm a member of the Oxford Cultural Collective. And yes, I, <laughs> I do a lot of that stuff. And I love food history. 
And there's a lecture I give with the provocative title, British food is not nearly as bad as you think it is. And what it really is, is the history of British cooking, which to me is fascinating when you think about the fact that the meat, the lamb, the beef is magnificent in quality. The vegetables that grow, some of them are wonderful. The berries are beautiful. The fruits are beautiful. The dairy products, the cheeses are magnificent. It's surrounded by waters that produce amazing fish and seafood. So uh, I push back against people saying there's no good food in Britain. But similarly, I push back against people who say there are no great British composers. And there is so much wonderful music, not just the famous rock and roll movement, which is stunning, but going all the way back in British music. And a couple of your inspirational choices were British, Purcell and Edward Elgar. Purcell, mm -hmm. I think, has come to claim a place uh, of being respected, but then people say Purcell and then Benjamin Britten and nothing in between. And that's just not true at all. But mm -hmm. one of my very favorites, and I feel that he, along with Ray Vaughan Williams, is undervalued, is Edward Elgar. And mm -hmm. you selected his most famous piece, apart from the cello concerto perhaps, mm -hmm. is the Enigma Variations, and specifically variation number nine, mm -hmm. uh, Nimrod. Why that, and what, what does Edward Elgar say to you as, as a lover of music, not necessarily as a British woman? Well, um, the, the, in answer to the Enigma Variations, I, um, my father, was was um, very um, instrumental in putting me in front of, of, of music and um, <clears throat> and show music actually a lot of show music but um, he he played the bass in a modern jazz trio but on again on the other side he was he played in a classical orchestra. So he was, he had a, you know, he, his, he was very, he was interested in, in, in a lot of music, beautiful music. And, um, well, Elgar was one of his passions. And I remember listening to the, the whole of the Enigma Variations when I was about 10, you know, and in particular the Nimrod. Um, and, um, it's just what can you say? It's very English. Yeah. Um, I loved Ken Russell's film of of Elgar. Actually, you know, Elgar cycling on the Malvern Hills, um, which is a beautiful countryside in 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 Shropshire. Is it Worcestershire? Sorry, Worcestershire. <laughs> I'm English and I don't know my counties. But but yeah, the, he, you know, he he was. You can see the countryside in his music, but the Nimrod, especially, um, I, I just, uh, it was, um, my, my father passed away a long time ago. <clears throat> and um, whenever I hear Nimrod, I just burst into tears. You know, it, it's just, I think, just got that element of depth and it's just wonderful, isn't it? I mean, what can I yeah. say? Um, I, I, um, it's it's, it's a quite an emotional thing for me personally, and um, the Elgar, of course, he he wrote many other wonderful pieces as well, and, and he's British, yes. I mean, yeah. they, they well, many, you don't have to defend British composers to me. There are so many <laughs> fine British composers. Um, he they enigmatically, have... pardon me. No, I was going to say I, I wish. Um, Oh, the 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 that his uh, it, wish we had his music for the national anthem. Yes, what they play every year in the last night of the proms. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> that's wonderful. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, you may not know because I never said this to you. I was named for three people. One of them a German philosopher my mother likes. Another was the dancer Fred Astaire. But the third was the British composer, Frederick Delius. 
Uh, my mother liked the philosopher, my father liked Delius, and they both liked Fred Astaire. That's how they came on the name. <laughs> so unlike most boys in New York City, I was raised on a steady diet of Frederick Delius, who was another composer who was either much appreciated or just not liked much at all. And I, mm. he is, wrote a couple of operas, and I think that they're mm. ready for a return. He wrote musical The Florida Suite because his father was a merchant in citrus fruit and sent him to Florida to send oranges back to the UK. But in fact, he was more taken with the music of African-Americans in Florida. And that led to other works by uh, Frederick Delius. Um, back to Elgar, the Enigma variations he named enigmatically. So we would all wonder what they were about. And I don't feel we have to have an answer, but I listened to them again yesterday and I recognized some of the music from Mozart's Symphony Number no. 38, the Prague Symphony. So I went back and looked at that score and I looked at the Elgar and I then read further and apparently somewhere in his thinking, we won't say it's a direct source, the Mozart Symphony Number no. 38, he had heard it, he came home, he started fiddling on the piano and his wife said, what is that? And Elgar said, it's an enigma. And <laughs> the melody, he was gonna put it aside and his wife was the one who encouraged him to actually go ahead and make variations on that music. So when our listeners listen now to the Enigma Variations, I hope they'll also on Idacho go and hear a version of Mozart's Symphony Number no. 38, the Prague Symphony. Wow. Um, hmm. It has been wonderful to visit with you, Rosalind Plowright. I look forward to whatever that next project is and frankly, everything you do, because as I said, the way I cast people for my series are the people who inspire me and you've always been one of them. So thank you for joining us. And Lovely you too. to talk to your friend and um, thank you for having me. I thank you. We'll much. have a British meal together next time I'm in the UK. Oh, absolutely. Please. I'd love that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Take Here. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.